Hi, my name is Beverly Tumala, and I'm a heart failure nurse specialist. And uh, we're going to do module four of living with heart failure, kind of putting it all together. So we're going to kind of bring all of those concepts that we've talked about in the previous modules and just kind of reinforce that information in this last module. So we talked about um, how heart failure is it's a huge deal and patient compliance is a big problem. And so um, one of the ways to improve compliance, especially with medications, is encourage patients to have a written schedule of their medications and use a pill tray. Help them uh, put pills in a tray so they can refill it on a weekly basis. That way they can keep up with uh, their refills and, and what they need. A great resource for this is medactionplan.com, and uh, it will allow you to make schedules for your patients. It will even allow your patients to make their own schedules. Um, for diuretics, a great uh, pearl for that is encourage your patients to take their diuretic, again, first thing in the morning, and then if they're on a twice-a-day dose, instead of taking that second dose in the evening, have them take it like mid-afternoon. Um, and with Lasix, Lasix got its name because it lasts six hours. So they can even take that second Lasix dose six hours after the first. And this will avoid um, the nightly trips to the bathroom and help them sleep better. If they report side effects to the doctor, and just let the doctor know how they're feeling, and they can be told that it's normal or it's not normal, but if the patients feel like they're understood and they're being heard, they're less likely to stop a certain medication because it's causing problems. And really important is let our patients know to never, ever stop any of their heart failure medications, even if they feel better, even if the heart failure's uh, gotten better or the, the heart function has normalized. We don't want them to stop any medications. We all have stories of our patients who, um, after being on their heart failure medicines, their ejection fraction improved, they went to their primary doctor, or just really didn't do any follow-up and decided to stop their medicines. And then the heart failure came back. So it's really important that we teach them to never stop any of their medications. For weighing every day, uh, we talked about how important this is. And again, this is gonna recognize fluid buildup before they have symptoms. And to do that, um, they need to use the same scale every day. They need to weigh every morning after they urinate, before they eat anything or get dressed and record their weights in a log or on a calendar so they can see the fluctuations and the changes that they're having. They're to report any rapid weight gain, that's two to three pounds in one or two days, or five pounds in one week. And if they're starting to accumulate fluid, we need to adjust the diuretic to get rid of that extra fluid. Also um, about scales, um, patients will have um, stories where they'll tell you, you know, well, at the doctor's office, I weigh this much, but at home, I weigh this much. The home weight is the important weight because that's the consistent weight. Uh, we will weigh them in the office just to kind of get an idea of how they're doing from one visit to the next. But that daily home weight is the important weight. So encourage them to weigh themselves at home every day and write it down. We talked about eating less salt and limiting fluid intake. And remember, their sodium limit is 2,000 milligrams per day or less. We want them to be able to identify high sodium foods, foods that are in their diet that have a lot of salt, or foods that they should avoid when they're at the grocery store. Um, learn to read food labels and have them avoid foods with more than 350 milligrams per day, or excuse me, per serving. So read those food labels, and if the sodium content is 350 milligrams or higher, they should either not eat it or just cut the serving size in half, and then they can still enjoy something they like. Um, some patients will require a fluid restriction. Again, not all, um, but most patients who are on high-dose diuretic or those who are early out of the hospital after an exacerbation, it's real important that they follow a, a fluid restriction. The balance of exercise and rest is something that I don't think we teach a lot of. We used to tell our heart failure patients to take it easy, you know, get a nice magazine prescription, subscription and sit on the porch and kind of watch life go by but the pendulum has strung, swung the other way. And we want our patients to be active. We want them to keep moving. And uh, there was a trial done about five years ago called um, Action HF. And it, it really emphasized the need for our patients to move. 
So we want them to be active and do a lot during the day. But with that said, we also want them to take periods of rest. So break up activity, like if they go to the doctor in the morning or um, go have breakfast or errands in the morning, come home and just have a period of where they can rest and put their feet up. Maybe take a nap if they need to. So break up periods of activity with periods of rest. Great activity um, and exercise um, examples would be walking, riding a bike, using a treadmill, swimming. They can do all of that as long as they're comfortable with it. And we'll talk about symptoms to watch for in a moment. Household activities are okay. They can mop, they can sweep, they can cook, they can do dishes, they can even mow the lawn and rake leaves. And our patients get into a dilemma because a lot of their family members think, you know, oh, mom, I don't want you to do that. Or dad, I don't think you should do that anymore. And we want our patients to stay active. So if they're comfortable raking leaves or working out in the yard, certainly let them do that. We don't want to turn them into cardiac cripples because again, we hope that their heart function normalizes and gets better and that they continue to have a, a fulfilled life. So the kind of um, activity limitations we ask them to watch for is that they should be able to walk and talk while doing activity. So if they're walking, they should be able to talk. If they're raking, they should be able to talk. If, if they can't talk and do what they're doing, they're doing too much. They need to avoid heavy lifting. So Typically, that would be anything over 20 pounds. But again, that varies with individuals because some of my young men were construction workers or worked uh, landscaping, and 20 pounds to them is nothing. But 50 pounds might be a lot. So basically, the rule would be if they have to strain to pick something up, we don't want them to do that. Heavy lifting is not good for the heart. Uh, they need to stop activity if they become short of breath, overly fatigued, develop chest pain or dizziness. Those are warning signs that they're doing too much. So you know, pretty much we, we want them to stay active and avoid symptoms if they can. We also advise them to reduce demands on the heart. Demands on the heart would be high blood pressure. So they need to make sure that their blood pressure is controlled, have frequent follow-up and keep the blood pressure monitored. Get rid of excess body fat. You know, obesity is a big strain on the heart. The heart has to work harder to circulate blood. They should stop smoking if they smoke. Um, and also control diabetes. Um, they need to keep their blood sugar in the desired range. When diabetics' blood sugars aren't within range, and if it gets too high, they'll pee a lot more and um, can get dehydrated. And so it's really hard for us uh, heart failure caregivers to adjust diuretics if their blood sugar is not well controlled. They need to notify their doctor if they feel sleepy or sleep a lot during the day. They may be suffering from what we call sleep apnea, and it's very common in heart failure patients. I would say probably roughly 40% of patients will be afflicted with sleep apnea and may need to have a sleep study to verify diagnosis. Patients need to stop or limit alcohol. Um, as we talked about in our first module, that alcohol can cause heart failure. So um, if they were a heavy drinker, we asked them to abstain from alcohol. But um, that said, a lot of my patients will say, well, can I have a glass of wine or a margarita? And an occasional drink won't hurt them, but um, we just wanted to have them keep it at a minimum. Emotional stress. <clears throat> this can't be stressed enough because patients with heart failure, but especially the younger ones, um, are afflicted at a time of their life where they're working and they're probably the breadwinner for their family. So this causes a lot of emotional distress. They are worried about their future. Am I going to live long enough? And we can see this in signs of depression, anger, anxiety. Those are very common. And so we encourage them to discuss these feelings with their doctor. And some may even benefit from short-term antidepressants just to get over the tide and as they begin to feel better and get accustomed to taking medicines and you know, how they're going to feel. Um, the, the antidepressant could be a benefit. Um, avoid temperature extremes. You know, these patients should avoid being out in a very hot day or a very cold day because the heart's got to work harder to maintain the proper temperature. So they need to address for the weather, and they also just need to avoid activities, you know, when it's really hot outside or exercise in a mall or go out later in the day when it's not as hot because then the heart won't have to work so hard. 
We um, monitor cholesterol levels. Again, we don't want any more blockages that can cause another heart attack and also put more muscle at risk. So we monitor cholesterol levels, and many will be on a cholesterol-reducing drug. And also stay away from people who are sick, sick with a cold or the flu. Heart failure patients tend to get a cold or the flu and keep it. And so they tend to get sicker with it, keep it longer, and it can may even develop into pneumonia and they end up in the hospital. It's not uncommon for us to have a, one or two patients a year hospitalized during the flu season. So flu shots and pneumonia shots are a must, and they um, need to get a flu shot every year. A pneumonia shot is typically every five years. They should avoid blood clots. So most of your patients will be on an aspirin or some sort of a blood thinning agent. We used to give heart failure patients, uh, especially those who had a very weak heart, let's say an ejection fraction less than 20%, we would put them on like warfarin or Coumadin to prevent blood clots from forming. And studies have shown that was not the proper thing to do. So we've kind of gotten out of that, that habit. But most of our patients will be on an aspirin. If they develop a blood clot or have atrial fibrillation, we'll put them on a, a potent blood thinner like Coumadin to just prevent them from developing blood clots or to dissolve the blood clots that are already present. You'll also see other types of blood thinners used. These have been um, released in the last five to eight years. Um, except Plavix. Plavix has been around for a while, but Effient, Xarelto, Berlenta, you're, we're seeing a lot more of those used, and especially in the elderly patients. Like with AFib, we don't want them to be on Coumadin because it's a high risk for bleeding, so they might be on one of these other agents. Or post-stent patients will have to be on some sort of a blood thinner, which might be, which might be one of these um, listed here. So living with heart failure, which we've learned in the last few modules, it's a very costly disease. It costs our healthcare system billions of dollars every year. Our hospitals are um, just are paying a penalty for these frequent readmissions and the cost of these patients. We expect the number of patients to double in the next 15 years as our baby boomers age, so heart failure numbers will rise. It's a very complex disease process. It's not easy to treat, and it requires a healthcare team. As you see, it requires a lot of medication. We talked about four typical ones, but you know we can add to that a blood thinner, a cholesterol medicine. If they have diabetes, they'll be on those medicines. So it requires a lot of medication and a lot of cost to maintain. Uh, dietary restrictions, uh, the sodium fluid restrictions are a must, and they're very hard to follow. So they need a lot of encouragement and just someone to emphasize the importance of staying on a sodium restriction and a fluid restriction if that's what we have them on. Therapy is lifelong. Even though they feel better, they'll still be taking medicines, they'll still be going to the doctor frequently, and we know that it afflicts the young and the old. Um, in my practice, my youngest patient was 16. My oldest patient, uh, Rita, when she died, she was 92. So it can run the gamut of age. So it's not just for the elderly. Um, it can also afflict the young. And it requires a team of healthcare providers um, that will support them through the process to answer questions, to help them decipher what's important, and just to listen, because it's, it's tough. And uh, also their provider at home, who's ever helping them, um, can get um, you know, fatigued, because you know, they're the ones helping with cooking, and, this patient is not feeling well and can't, you know, sometimes can be a little cranky. So, you know, support their family and support the wives and husbands and children of these patients. I'd like to close with a saying from Elizabeth Kubler Ross The most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation a sensitivity and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people don't just happen. I'd like to say that probably the most beautiful people I've met and encountered were my heart failure patients. They've come out of the depths and they've been given um, a reality check. And um, I think as healthcare providers, we become beautiful people because we in turn return the compassion and the love and support that they need, and I would hope that you would do in the future.